I don't collect a lot of things. I have a lot of things, but I wouldn't say I collect a lot of things. One of the few things I actually collect, though, is old digital cameras from the 90s and early 2000s. And boy, howdy, have I got some weird ones. There's the one that's mostly a touchscreen. And there's the one that shoots on a failed competitor to the zip disk. And there's the one that can send emails. I got some real weird ones, but these ones are weirder. They're also terrible, which is why I'm here on this awful overcast day uh, to see if they can make anything of it. Personally, I doubt it. Our two competitors are a Minolta Dimage V and a Toshiba PDR5. They're both made in the mid late 90s, which is why they're awful. Digital photography just wasn't really a thing yet. I mean, it sort of was, but it, it wasn't worth anything unless you were paying more for your camera than you had for your car. And these <laughs> definitely didn't reach that price point. The tech just wasn't there yet to make reasonable consumer digital cameras, but companies were trying desperately to figure out how to take what did exist and turn it into a product they could sell. And I wanna show you some of the bizarre decisions that led to. We'll start with the Toshiba because uh, of the two, it comes the closest to being normal. It has virtually no controls whatsoever. You can't really adjust anything on it. You just point and shoot. And there we go, we took a picture. And there's nothing at all remarkable about that until you go to get that picture off. Because this had the misfortune we made in the 90s, it doesn't have USB. And that's good for us because even as a collector of terrible old cameras, if this had USB, I wouldn't even give it the time of day. Okay, that's, that's not true, I lied. I lied to you. I'd still love this camera because it takes pictures that look like this. That's my delightful cat Soba, by the way, uh, who will always be the new cat just like Udon, even though I've had them for four months. Both of them are gorgeous, but nothing is as eye-pleasing as a cat photographed with a really bad camera, and this thing's firing on no cylinders. It's got that bottom tier, hard OCP forums in 1999 energy on tap anytime you need it, so perfect camera, no notes. If you get a chance to buy one, pick it up, etc., etc. But in all seriousness, as far as how it performs as a camera, well, here, it handled the photo of the Pike Place sign better than I expected. You can make out the sky, the sign, the roof, uh, despite the overcast lighting, and some truly crappy cameras I've messed with can't even manage that, so more than zero stars. I also expected this to be unusable in the dark, but it surprised me. Uh, I took it down into the depths of the market where I figured I'd get nothing but noise, and yeah, sure enough, the pictures are pretty dim and dismal, but they are pictures. Uh, it does some strange things to color, uh, like this uranium glass, it was uh, UV illuminated. It came out stark blue, uh, even though the GoPro had no trouble seeing the blinding green glow. So yeah, the pictures are a little weird, they're incredible, but it does produce pictures, uh, which is pretty impressive for a camera this cheap from 1998. So anyway, let's get back on track. 1998 was just a little bit too early for USB to be common on devices. See, this doesn't have it. So how do you get the pictures off? Well, you, you slide the bottom open, you take the memory card out and you put it in a card reader. You know, those were available. Uh, you could buy one that plugged into USB if you were lucky enough to have that, uh, but you weren't. Uh, so you could go with a parallel port model like uh, this guy here, just plugs into your printer port as it were. And if you were really hard up, uh, you could occasionally even go with serial. So things were in a bad way, but you know, you could get by if you needed to. Problem was, all these readers cost about a hundred bucks a pop, which uh, at the time could buy you a hundred double cheeseburgers, so the priorities were obvious. Saving a Benjamin meant a lot more then than it does now, and since the camera itself could read memory cards, it'd be nice if you could just plug that into your computer instead of buying a whole separate thing. But since parallel ports used way too many pins, the only real option was serial, and a bunch of cameras took that route. In fact, uh, this one has it as an option, this headphone jack looking thing on the side, uh, is actually uh, a serial port. It uses this very cursed looking cable uh, to convert from 2.5 millimeter phone plug to a standard DE9. You can transfer photos directed to your PC that way with no card reader. Uh, the problem is, well, uh, good luck if you lose this cable. You also need the proprietary software and it was slow as hell. It's really amazing just how revolutionary USB was. If you don't know this, PCs had no external high-speed interfaces before USB. There was just serial and parallel, the same ports you could find on an IBM PC in 1981, and they were old technology even then. They got a lot faster since they were introduced, but still, they're primitive technology. 
Max, at least, had SCSI, but that used a whole shitload of wires, so it wasn't practical for hooking up tiny devices like cameras. The only other high-speed interface you'd find on anything was exclusive to laptops, and that was PCM-CIA. It uh, took these little cards and it ran at some number of megabytes per second, more than fast enough for downloading your photos. Plus, it supported standard interfaces. You could plug a hard drive into this and it would just pop up without any drivers. So it seems like a great solution for hooking up your camera, but there's a problem. This is basically an internal slot. It's like having a PCI slot hanging out the side of your machine. It's ISA, really, but same difference. These cards have 68 pins on them. Nice, I think. And you can't exactly make a 68 pin extension cable to plug it into the device. But there weren't really any other options. So if you can't bring the bus to the camera, bring the camera to the bus. The PDR5 is one of a few Toshiba cameras that had built-in PCM-CIA interfaces. Uh, this guy flips out from the back. It's supposed to be spring-loaded, but the plastic hinge broke over the years. Natch. Uh, and you slide the whole shoot and match into the side of your laptop to transfer your photos. And uh, I'd love to demo this for you, but I don't have the drivers, which is uh, kind of asinine because I just got done saying PCMCIA didn't require drivers for storage devices, but this one does, which makes it like 10 times less clever than it could have been, kind of a bummer. Uh, now, the smart media flash format that this uses for storage is ancient and it doesn't speak the ATA protocol, so I'm guessing they would have had to put a converter in there and that probably cost too much, that's probably why that didn't happen. Uh, so I can't make this work, but I don't really need to because we've seen this trick before. Nikon did it two years earlier in 1996 for all the same reasons, and I did a video on here talking all about it. Uh, but with this guy, it kind of made more sense. With the Coolpix, you pull the battery pack off and it exposes a completely ordinary PCM CAA card, uh, which you can then just jam into the side of your laptop. And that does show up as a standard mass storage device. Now, it looks ridiculous, because um, I mean, yeah, but also because it dwarfs the actual camera. I mean, the camera is 75% plug. But uh, since this camera's controls are really minimalist and there's no rear screen or anything, you couldn't actually fit your hand on it by itself. So putting this big stupid plug on the bottom gave you something to hold on to. Besides, that's where the battery goes. So it's a lot like what the Toshiba is doing, uh, but there's one big difference. The Toshiba card has holes in it. See, the world of consumer digital cameras had changed a lot in the two years since the Nikon came out. And by 1998, manufacturers were really starting to give up on their weird idea that just because something was a digital camera, that it didn't need to be camera shaped. Unlike the Coolpix, the back of this camera actually serves a purpose. So there isn't really anywhere for a PCMCAA card to fold up. They had to put these holes in here so you could see the LCD screen, the viewfinder, and the D-pad and the menu button, which they actually had to put on the card itself. This wasn't easy to implement either. Those 68 conductors all need to go through here. And normally there'd be a big printed circuit board with room for 68 traces, but since there's kind of a window taking up 90% of the real estate, they had to go with this folded up flexible PCB uh, in order to fit all the conductors around the openings. It's all very barbarian, but the wildest thing is that it made perfect sense. There really wasn't a better solution, not for a camera that you could use on the go without any support equipment, which is what early digital cameras were often intended for. People like insurance inspectors and real estate agents who needed to go take pictures of things, sometimes in distant locations, and immediately email them to someone. With this thing, all you needed was the camera itself and a laptop. And this isn't just a convenience feature either. I mean, it was nice not to have to bring an extra piece of crap with you just to read your photos, but with USB being nearly non-existent, that piece of crap was probably parallel or serial, and it probably required extra power, like the SanDisk reader that expects a DC input. So if you wanted to work from your car, you were gonna have to bring along an inverter, which is just too much hassle. Now I'm sure there were other readers that just slurped the juice off the keyboard port instead so they didn't have that problem, but I still think Toshiba were geniuses to figure out this particular solution. I really wish they'd made it driverless, that's a real disappointment, but again, 1998 was a hell of a time to be alive. Um, in the end, this is still less absurd than the other camera I'm gonna show you. Minolta called this the Damage V, and uh, yes, I'm certain that's not a Roman numeral five because this was actually Minolta's first consumer digital camera. It can't be the fifth of anything. 
And I want you to keep that in mind too, that Minolta decided in 1997 to enter the consumer digital market with this thing. Just, just remember that for later. You'll see why it was a remarkable decision shortly. I mean, it's easy to think that I'm talking about this situation, uh, where the lens and sensor are separate from the camera. They're in this little black pod on the side that tilts up and down. And that's not for safe storage or anything. That's actually how you use it. You can take pictures with this rotated in any direction you like. And that's funky, but it's not the remarkable part because it's not unique. See, Nikon made a bunch of cameras in the Coolpix 900 series starting in 1998 uh, that all had the same thing going on. This uh, Coolpix 990 is an example from a couple years later, but it's got the same basic principle. This rotates up and down. That allows you to take a picture with the camera above you pointing forward, but you can still see the screen. Or below you, same situation. Or you can look straight forward and take a picture either looking up or looking down or even facing yourself without looking away from the screen. It's a clever idea and it's the same basic thing that Minolta is doing. Now these cool pixels were pretty popular. So even if they were the first people to do it, which I think might be the case, it probably wasn't a unique feature for more than like a month or two uh, before this series came out. And it's certainly not a shocking sight if you're at all familiar with early digital cameras. Uh, and besides that, neither company actually did it first. The design goes back even further uh, to a camcorder called the ViewCam from I think 1992. So really Sharp did it first. And you know, in the end, this is just a backwards version of the tilting LCD that's been common for over a decade in modern cameras. I mean, if you imagine that this is the camera, then this is the screen that you can tilt in any direction you need. They just made them smaller nowadays. It's also not as good as the Nikon. Uh, for instance, this Coolpix has power zoom. You can press these buttons on the back to zoom the lens in and out. But the Minolta has manual zoom. You have to rack this little lever here, which I don't think I've seen on any compact camera in my life. Like not even once. I, manual focus, yeah, but manual zoom is the most Jurassic design choice I've ever seen. It's a cost cutting measure that's completely unprecedented as far as I'm aware of. And then there's the flash. The Coolpix puts the flash right next to the lens, so it rotates with the lens. The Minolta puts it on the body, so it doesn't rotate with the lens. In fact, it won't even fire the flash unless the lens is pointing straight forward. That fact will come up again later. So the design is not revolutionary, and uh, as far as shooting, it doesn't really work much differently than the Toshiba. This one has a few more controls, but you know, most of them just make the picture worse. And yeah, it's got the tilting lens, but for the most part, still, you just point and shoot. And then it takes a really, really long time to save the picture. Although having gotten the pictures home to take a look at them, I'd say they're worse than the Toshiba. There's less color, less dynamic range, and there's this bizarre Game Boy-esque dithering pattern everywhere. I don't know what that's about. So the Minolta is not a great camera. The pictures aren't fantastic. It's extremely slow. It has no settings really. You can adjust the exposure with these buttons on top, but it only ever seems to blow the picture out or make it too dark to see anything. You can't even set the white balance. This looks pretty damn uninteresting, unless you actually looked at the thumbnail before clicking the video, in which case you have an idea where this is going. What makes the Minolta special is this little latch here, which lets you take the sensor completely off the camera. Yeah, there it is. I just have it now. Obviously, this is not terribly useful. I mean, this could be useful. Like, uh, what if you could replace this module with one that had a longer lens? Well, Minolta thought of that too. The later Dimage EX1500 did have two modules available with different length lenses, and it was supposedly going to get another one eventually with an upgraded sensor. Well, you can probably guess if I think that ever happened. No, I don't. If you have one of those cameras, by the way, send me an email. I need one, for reasons. The Dimage V, however, never got any upgrades that I know of, and I don't think it was supposed to. The reason this sensor comes off is because you can use it this way. Because it came with an extension cord. Plug that in there, clip this on here, and now we can put the sensor 40 inches away from the body. That's about a meter for you Americans out there. With it tethered like this, the picture, of course, still shows up on the screen. So I can point the sensor wherever I want, 
and I don't need to move where the actual display is. And that means I can put the sensor places that would be impossible to get to with my head, like under something or behind myself or above and over something and get pictures that would otherwise be impossible to take except blindly by just sticking the whole camera out, taking it and then looking at the back to see what you got. That means you can take some pictures that would otherwise be impossible. Like uh, if you are a tourist visiting Pike Place with a normal camera, well, good luck getting any pictures that don't look like this. Even on a quiet day, mostly what you see here is people's backs. But with the Minolta, you can periscope the sensor right up over everyone's heads and get something a little more interesting without straining your neck too much. I got another good example by accident while I was out at my local hardware store looking for batteries to feed this miserable thing since it eats a set of double A's faster than a Game Boy. I noticed a train stopped out back with two incomplete airliners in tow, just some of the local flavor of the Seattle metro region. Now, if I'd had any other contemporary camera, I'd have had a pretty tough time getting a shot because the only angle I could get while looking at the screen would be something like this. But with the addition of the CCD extension cable, which I can't believe is a normal sentence in my life, I could hold the sensor up over the fence and get this masterpiece. Yeah, real great stuff, isn't it? Stellar photography, memories to last a lifetime. The principle here is fantastic. It's a brilliant idea to separate the display and the sensor. And in fact, this technique is still in use today, although it's limited to products that cost half a million dollars. The Sony Venice, uh, for instance, is a cinema camera used ostensibly to shoot actual movies, and it offers an extension pack called the Rialto that does the exact same trick. Now, cinema cameras are normally big, bulky things, and the value here is that you can set most of that weight aside and mount just the sensor and the lens on a Steadicam, for instance, without having to support the full weight. Uh, or you can sneak the sensor into a tiny, cramped space you'd otherwise be unable to fit a camera in at all. Now, Minolta brought that same noise to a consumer digital camera, which was a really intriguing decision that set their product apart from everything else. If you had one of these, you could visit the Pike Place fish counter and maybe actually get a picture of the fish flying instead of the people watching that. There's no crowd. How can I demonstrate this thing when there's no crowd? We can just look at the fish. The whole point was to look over people's heads to see the fish, but there's no heads to look over. My roast is ruined. Dang it, Seattle tourists, you've let me down for the last time. Uh, or you can stick your sensor way out over the edge of a building or a bridge, and if you dropped it, hey, no big deal. The ball's on a string and it's attached to the cup. It would all have been such a great idea if this miserable thing shot at a higher resolution than a late 80s PC. Just like the Toshiba, this shoots at a crisp 640 by 480, which is barely tolerable already. Like, you really have to bring your A-game to make a VGA resolution photo look good at all. But not only is the Minolta starved for pixels, but the ones it has aren't too hot. I took some of the same shots with this that I did with the Toshiba, and most of the time, it's just a sea of colored noise. Uh, the picture of the sign outside did okay, and this ukulele was passable, but both of those were lit by the sun. If you're indoors, you're out of luck. It's just static, basically. Now, to be fair, the electronics in here could be ailing, I guess. I mean, the thing's 25 years old. Let me tell you, if it's aged like I have, I'm stunned it could even get out of bed and show up at the studio today. And actually, it didn't, really. This is the second one I bought. This is the first one. Uh, this lasted about 10 minutes, and then it started spitting out LSD dream emulator nonsense. So I had to get the second one and Frankenstein the parts together, uh, which I gotta say was easier with this than anything else I've had to do that with before. But both these sensors are getting on in years. Maybe some caps are going bad in both of them and the pictures used to look better, but maybe not. One of these came with a card in it and the timestamps on the pictures claim to be from when it was new so we can see how it looked then. Now, normally I avoid sharing pictures that come in people's cameras, but I think we're okay here. I don't think anyone's gonna mind me showing you him. I bet his name is Pot Roast. I think it's his birthday. Now this first picture was obviously taken without flash. And yeah, the ISO here is so bad that the noise floor is more like a noise ceiling. With flash, it clearly does a bit better, but it's still not an incredible shot. The Toshiba takes a much better cat pick. And unless you are shooting with flash or under direct sunlight, this is what you have to look forward to. And even if you wanna use flash, it's only really convenient if the sensor is on the body. Otherwise, you have to finagle with the camera to get the flash pointed where it needs to go while still keeping the screen visible, which almost makes this pointless. And as I mentioned, the flash won't fire unless the sensor is pointing straight forward, which still applies even if it's on the tether. 
So while you could maybe do some neat bounce flash tricks, you have to hold the clip on the extension pointing forward and it doesn't want to stay there and there's no arrow to show you which direction that is. And I don't even know if that works because I can't get this to take a picture with flash at all. I'm not sure why, but it doesn't seem to be able to finish charging no matter how long I leave it on. And even better, when I turn the flash on, the screen fills up with colorful warbling static, which doesn't make me feel great about how the resulting picture would look. So like I said, it's a bad camera in a lot of ways, most of which are not due to its age. But props to Minolta for coming up with the concept. It's a brilliant idea. It's very forward thinking. And if they'd held onto it for just a couple more generations, they could have put out some fantastic two megapixel cameras that would probably still be adored collectibles today. Unfortunately, uh, other than the EX1500, they never did this again. There was just something about that mid 90s period that made companies try things that were wildly ahead of their time. And when it ended, so many of them never went back to the well. I don't think Minolta ever made anything this unusual again. They made other cameras, but they were all very by the book. And Toshiba, well, when they gave up on the camera market in 2004, nobody even remembered that they'd made cameras. Imagine what the future would look like though if these companies had continued applying themselves. But I'm done applying myself for today, so if you enjoyed this, hey, glad to hear it. Uh, it'd be cool if you subscribed so I know you're interested in what I'm doing. Uh, remember to turn on notifications if you want to find out when I do new stuff. Uh, but if you really like what I'm doing, then consider supporting me on Patreon like these people here are doing. I literally couldn't do this without their help. Like seriously, it would be impossible to pay for the studio or to spend $400 on a Lark importing possibly broken cameras from the UK. And these folks are the only reason my channel still exists and functions. So I am incredibly grateful to all of them. Thank you all so much and everyone else. Thanks for watching. Oh shit, I didn't say two of them.